Hello, my name is Sindre. And I'm Renata. And this is Gikare Humanum. We've gotten our first iTunes review. What does it say? The user I Draw Gods and Monsters from the Philippines says I love how relaxed these two are and how they're just randomly laughing at what <laughs> they're talking about with each other. It's like you're a friend visiting and you're just having a casual chat with them about geek stuff in their living room right after they put the baby to sleep. <laughs> yeah, that's actually what we were going for. Yeah, that's uh, the type of podcast we like to listen to. The ones where you just feel like you're listening in on a nice conversation between friends. So that's exactly what we were hoping to achieve with this podcast. Maybe something to keep you company. Thanks for the great review. Yeah, and if there's anyone who wants us to cover a topic, remember that you can suggest one if you leave us an iTunes review. That way we know what you guys want us to talk about. Yeah. So, on this podcast we have talked about movies, television shows, books, music, even tabletop RPGs. But we have not yet talked about video games. So I was thinking that for this episode we would talk about our relationship to video games. Okay, sounds good. So Renate, let's start with you. What are some of your early gaming memories? What video games did you like as a child and such? Um, Me and my brother, we had a NAS, a Nintendo. But uh, the games were expensive, so we didn't have so many games. We had uh, not a double feature, but a triple feature that came with the console. And the games were Super Mario 1 and Tetris and some soccer game. Can't remember what what it was called. And... um, Well, Tetris and Super Mario, that's some classic games. Yeah, those are those are still... uh, Still still amazing today in this day. (laughs) <laughs> you can still go back and play those games and have a great time. Yeah, Tetris never gets old. <laughs> um, but uh, the soccer game was a bit meh back then as well. After a while we also bought uh, Super Mario 3, which uh, that's really fantastic. I still love that game. We also had uh, one of the Castlevania games. Was it uh, Castlevania 2? Mm, I'm not sure. Uh, it was called Dracula's Curse, I think. Oh, alright. And we had one called Kabuki Quantum Fighter or something like that. And those were all the NES games we had. <laughs> I haven't heard about that one. I think we just got it from one of those discount bins. So I think you had like long red hair and you killed the enemy by headbanging <laughs> your hair into them or something like oh, that. Oh, like a whip? You. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So was it a side-scroller kind of? Yeah. Well, I know Castlevania is uh, considered classics today. But at that time, I kind of saw them as similar, equal in the style. I don't know. Yeah, Castlevania and Kabuki. Quantum Fighter, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, because I've never heard about Kabuki Quantum Fighter. I've never played Castlevania myself, uh, but I've heard about it and that they are amazing. And I really want to try it sometime. But uh, Kabuki, uh, what's it called? Quantum Fighter. Kabuki Quantum Fighter. That's a really cool name, but (laughs) I've never heard about it. Oh, I I don't know anything about it, and I haven't played it since the 90s, so (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) It does sound kind of similar to Castlevania, because in Castlevania it's a side-scroller and you use a whip. Mm. And then in Kabuki Quantum Fighter it sounds like you use uh, your hair as a whip, so... As far as I remember. Sounds sounds pretty (laughs) cool, actually. (laughs) Well, I, I just have to say one thing about Castlevania. It's cool and all. Uh, I really like the style of it and the music is great. But I also remember it as very annoying because it's one of those games that if you get hit by something, your character will just automatically jump backwards one big step. So it's like you get hit by an enemy and then your character jumps back and falls into a pit. Yeah. So that's very annoying. Yeah, I don't really like that mechanic either. In, in most cases, that uh, just causes a lot of annoyance. In some Mario games, that's also the case. When you get hit by some fire, uh, Mario gets heated up and uh, you lose control of him and he just runs uh, 
randomly because he's like hot and burning. It's not just in Mario Odyssey. It could be just in Mario Odyssey, but I'm but I'm pretty sure that it is in other games as well. At least in other three D Mario games. Okay, I'm more I'm most uh, familiar with the side scroller. Mario games. I'm old school. <laughs> I've played mostly the side-scroller Mario games as well, but I've watched uh, some Let's Play, uh, like Game Grumps and stuff. And I think there is uh, one of the older 3D Mario games where that also happens, where you get hit by fire and Mario just loses control, just runs around. And, and that's the same case that he it often causes him to just run right into la- lava and stuff. And that's just... Extra annoying. It's enough of a punishment to lose health when you get hit. It's really annoying to also lose control of your character and die as a result of it. Yeah, kind of like when you get burnt in real life and you start crashing into the kitchen cupboards. (laughs) Yeah, that happens to me all the time. I burn my finger and I just (laughs) start running into... Yeah, and you're a chef, so... (laughs) Yeah, I'm... Yeah, my day job is being a chef, so sometimes it's like the hustle and bustle in the kitchen, so you often burn yourself a little bit, and then you just completely lose control and just runs into cabinets and stuff. Mm-hmm. That's, uh, my point, exactly. Yeah, so that that is pretty realistic in terms of... Uh, yeah, there's a lot of people that uh, like to have a lot of realism in, in video games, so yeah, that's, uh, that's a realistic thing that Mario captures. Yeah. <laughs> So back to your Nintendo Entertainment System. You said that you couldn't afford a lot of video games, but did you end up renting a lot back then? Uh, Not on the regular Nintendo, I think. But uh, later we got the Super Nintendo and we used to rent uh, Mortal Kombat 2 on it. Yeah. And I also think we were... I remember renting a Adam's Family game. Oh, cool. And maybe some Judge Dredd and I... Clay Fighter? Clay Fighter? Yeah, it was, it was, a, it was probably not a very good game. <laughs> but, uh, but I mostly played the first Donkey Kong game, because that came with the machine. <laughs> yeah, a few years ago I bought you for Christmas the Super Nintendo Mini that came out, that had a lot of uh, video games included in it. Mm. And we played Donkey Kong Country together, like we switched controls uh, every level. Or so. Mm. I think that's the only game where I was more skilled than you. <laughs> yeah, you can say that again. I had a good time playing it with you, but it is also a very frustrating game for me. I think it's <laughs> like kind of too hard. A lot of those old games, the levels are very long and there's no checkpoints and there's like one very hard part like at the at the end and you have to play the whole thing again and stuff like that. Yeah, that that was kind of fun, me being like, do you want me to do that for you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you of, you often say that now, too, with modern games and stuff. But yeah, but that's a joke. That's <laughs> Yeah, but in, in the Donkey Kong... Uh, I actually did some parts for you. Yeah, and I was like, you at some parts I was getting really frustrated and a bit angry. <laughs> I love that game. I think when you were a kid... You have... Um... I only had that game, so I was playing it all the time. Yeah, exactly. And you're more patient when you're a kid, at least when it comes to video games. You can try again and try again and try again, and you improve at it. But when you're older, you don't have that much patience for games that make it really difficult for you, unless that is something that is specifically built into the video games, like your Dark Souls or Hotline Miami, both games which I love, but the difficulty is specifically built into the video game and there are allowances made for it. It's weird because I've been watching you playing those games a little bit and I'm like, Ugh. I would never play those games that look so time consuming and repetitive and boring. Which is strange because all games were like that back in the days. <laughs> oh, but I promise you, both mm. those games are really good. Yeah, and for me, the really difficult, like Dark Soul type game for me is uh, Donkey Kong Country. <laughs> That's much more frustrating. Okay, each to their own, I guess. Yeah, but I did have a good time. I'm not saying that. I got. A lot of nostalgia for it too so it's like just the graphics and the music it makes me go Aha. yeah it's really cute 
it's really cute graphics and uh, and art style. I really like it. Yeah, and um, since we had so few games, I can also uh, mention that my brother had a Star Wars game that we used to play. No, he used to play. I was just watching. And then he had uh, Mortal Kombat 3. So, yeah. For context, uh, he's your older brother, right? Yeah. So uh, he was the one who brought gaming into our household and I was just like, okay. Yeah, that uh, Star Wars game, uh, how did that play? What kind of game was that? I think it was for Return of the Jedi, if I'm not mistaken. What did you do in it? I don't know, jumping around with your lightsaber, <laughs> so it was killing a, enemies. It was also a side-scroller? Uh, I think it was different from different levels because I remember there was one with um, you know on that uh, forest moon Endor Endor where they are riding those uh, thingies <laughs> yeah those um, robot things <laughs> no those uh, you know those that Luke and Leia are riding when the stormtroopers when they are being chased by stormtroopers yeah I know what scene you are referring to mm. like speed bikes I think they're... yeah speed bikes yeah yeah so there's some side scrolling levels and there's some racing levels with speed bikes right yeah I think so I I didn't play it much myself you mostly watch your brother play yes it was his he bought it uh, but uh, with Mortal Kombat since that is a two-player game I bet you play that a lot with him yeah he always wanted to play with me uh, probably because I was easy to beat well I don't know about easy to beat because when I played you you always beat me <laughs> yeah I got better the fun thing about Mortal Kombat is when you can learn combos yeah you can remember them and utilize them in in combat. Yeah, for those that don't know, Mortal Kombat is a fighting game where you see the characters from the side and you press different buttons. That one one button is a high kick and you press different buttons to do different combat moves. And if you press a combination of buttons, say on the PlayStation square square triangle x i don't know if that is a combo but it could possibly be a combo that made you do a special move and uh yeah so if you remember those then you are better at the game well you kind of just work them into your fingers and you could guess a lot of them but one thing you couldn't guess was the combination you have to press in order to do a fatality oh the endings. I think we downloaded them. So you had a printed page where it said the combinations? Yeah, for fatalities and you also had animality and babality and pit fatality. Yeah, let's uh, <laughs> describe these different uh, alities. <laughs> so fatality, that's of course... That's uh, like a violent death. Like... Yeah, you, you're, you're doing a very violent finishing move. Yeah, it's like uh, at the end of the game they are standing kind of punch drunk and you get the message, finish him. And then you can either just slap your opponent or kick him or something, or you can perform one of these uh, alities. Yeah. So when you do a fatality, you just press some buttons. I think one of the most uh, well-known fatalities, the one that springs to my mind when I think about it, is one where one of the characters takes the other character by the neck and then rips their head out of their body and the spinal cord comes with it. Yeah. It... So, so that's the kind of violence we're talking about here. Very cartoony, but very <laughs> violent. It was... Uh... I think it was very controversial at the time, but if you see it today, it's all very pixelated and it doesn't really look like, it doesn't look very realistic. Yeah, what is scary there is what your mind fills in. Yeah, I think it was more scary to the adults knowing that the kids were playing these games. Yeah, when in actuality, kids have always been interested in violence like from the middle ages and then uh, there was babality yeah then you just turned your opponent into a baby and then there was animality then you became an animal and ate your opponent i think so also pretty gruesome ah uh, yeah but the graphics weren't that good so yeah and then there was a pit fatality where you just threw them into a pit where there was uh, revolving knives or something. Yeah, so that's just certain levels you could do that. To, um... Yeah, certain arenas. <laughs> yeah, there would have to be an actual pit there. It wouldn't just... No, yeah. of course. 
You can't throw people into pits when there aren't pits. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> you learn something new every day. Yeah, uh, but as I mentioned, we uh, played uh, Mortal Kombat a bit uh, together on the PlayStation 3 mm-hmm. early in our relationship. And uh, you were much better than me. But we've also tried uh, on the on the SNES Mini, you can play Street Fighter and you also whooped my ass in that one. Because uh, you, you have some skills at fighting games, while I do not have any skills at fighting games. Yeah, I haven't really played Street Fighter 2. You know, I may have tried it at some point at the toy store when I was a kid. Because then you just went to the toy stores and tried out the different consoles. And yeah. <laughs> spent hours there. But uh, yeah, I don't have that much experience with Street Fighter. And that's older than Mortal Kombat. So it's not as good. Yeah, Mortal Kombat is an iteration on Street Fighter. And for many people, they would say that they improved the gameplay of Street Fighter. Made it more cool and more violent looking. Yeah. Yeah, so that's it for Mortal Kombat. I think uh, I remember you saying you had a Game Boy Color. Yeah, well, you know, the regular Game Boy was around for years and years. And I wanted one of those, uh, but I never got one. And uh, then they released the Game Boy Color. Mm -hmm. And I was very excited because I was thinking that that would be, you know, the dawn of a new thing. Yeah. So I got one for Christmas and I actually had the first Mario game on that one too. Oh yeah, yeah, cool. So it was the same game that I had on the regular Nintendo. Yeah, and just for people that don't know, the Game Boy system is a portable gaming system. So you had the first Super Mario game Mm -hmm. on a console uh, linked to your TV and now you had one that you could carry in your pocket. Yeah. Same game. Yeah, the only difference was that I think you could save. Oh, you couldn't on the first one? No. Oh. You had to play through the whole game. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's why they had those... Uh, those secret... Um, level gates. Yeah. But anyway, Game Boy Color wasn't a huge success. It wasn't? I don't think so. I, or I think it was. As much as Game Boy? I think it was so. much more short-lived yeah that could be they they came out with the game boy advance some years later hmm. i just remember that i got so much use out of my game boy color <laughs> i had hardly none and i i didn't get any more games either oh yeah yeah that's uh and the screen wasn't lit up so i found that kind of annoying you couldn't like play in your bed at night time <laughs> you needed to have lights on oh really i uh, i don't remember that but i think so yeah, you're probably right. I don't right. think it was backlit. That's really weird if they didn't backlight it. I remember the first Game Boy, they had like, you could buy extra equipment like lights that you attach to the screen, I yeah. think. And you could also buy a, a magnifying glass that you could <laughs> attach to yeah, the screen. So, so you got the bigger screen. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's, that, that's I think funny. So. I never owned one myself. So. Uh, I'll, I'll include a link to a picture of that down in the show notes. Okay, then I can look at that. But uh, you had Game Boy Color as well, didn't you? Yeah, not only that, I also had the first Game Boy. Oh! Yeah, I got it from my... I think I got it from my dad. I was really young at the time, so I can't really remember. You still uh, have that? No, I think it broke. I think you were not very careful with your toys. Yeah, because I remember that when we were together, you had a whole case of Game Boy Color games that you gave to me because you had ruined your own Game Boy Color. Yeah. And I tried playing your games, but all the cartridges were broken too. (laughs) So I couldn't play any of your games. Yeah, I think that's more with how I had stored them, probably. I think... When I last used them, they've worked fine, but then they had been in storage for like many years. And uh... my Super Mario game still works. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> did you have it in the original casing or something? Well, to be fair, I think it was inside the Game Boy Color all the time. Yeah. Since I just had one game, I didn't bother to take it out. My games just li- lay open in a in a box. The cartridge just it was just loose in a box. But I haven't thrown them away because I'm thinking that we try to cleanse them. Maybe they'll work. Yeah, it could be. I don't know. I remember those old games. You just had to like blow really hard inside the slot. Yeah, I remember doing that a bunch. Did you play any games for the PC 
we've covered a lot of Nintendo consoles, but any games for the PC or early PlayStation? Or I've played uh, PlayStation at friends' houses, but uh, it's not. It wasn't very memorable. I remember playing a James Bond game, but that was like. Is that Goldeneye? I don't know. <laughs> that's that's a really famous James Bond game. It had one of the really early good uh, multiplayer features. Mm. And I think you could play as Odd Job, the guy that throws his bowler hat at people to kill them. I can't remember anything. <laughs> I never played it myself, but I have heard people talking about it online. Okay, then you then you know more than me. <laughs> yeah, but you asked about PC games. Um, yeah, like with the other consoles, it was mostly my brother playing games and me watching him. But uh, we did play some Worms together. Yeah, Worms. Those, yeah. Those are great. Yeah, so I bought that later too for PlayStation Three. So you remember playing with me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we pro- yeah we played a bunch of Worms early in our relationship. It was yeah. fun. Yeah, we could do that again. Yeah, we could, and when our daughter is old enough, it's yeah, gonna be really fun to play sure. with her. But but the side uh, is it called side scroller. Do you call that side scroller? I don't like the three D Worms. Yeah, that's just a one-off. I don't think it, there was many 3D Worms games. Yeah, I have that one too, because I think I bought one disc with three, three Worms. Yeah, games. I remember we, we tried it out, but it wasn't that fun. For yeah. those that don't know what Worms is, imagine a, a tank game on a 2D plane, where there's a bunch of tanks on a hill, and you have to arch your shots to get in a hit on other tanks. I'm pretty sure... That was the basis of Worms, that there were games like that with tanks before Worms. And then they made a different version where instead of tanks, you had this tiny anthropomorphic worms that carry small bazookas. (laughs) And you have to arch your bazooka shots to get in a hit on these worms. And they're very cartoony, so they react in a, a cartoony way when they get hit. But they also have other weapons like mines they can lay out and blow torches that they can use to burrow their way into the hill and banana bombs yeah banana bombs and that's exploding the... grandmas yeah they have a lot of cool funny gag weapons like an exploding sheep that you can release <laughs> and then press the button to make it explode and, and the worms are very cute and uh, yeah adorable and... yeah and, uh, and also you have a lot of fun making up team names and you make names for all the worms on your team. Yeah, so you can make names for people you know or like pop culture characters or anything like that. And then you can go like, oh, Jerry Se- Seinfeld just got bombed <laughs> or stuff like that. It's just fun to make up names of the worms. I think I had an X-Files team when I was playing you. Yeah, I remember that, and, I, and I'm pretty sure that I made a Doctor Who team. Yeah. And a bunch of stuff like that. You can also like pick different nationalities for your worms. So yeah. So they'll have like funny little phrases that they say when they... Yeah, it changes the dialogue of the worms, and they speak in like squeaky voices. If you have an Australian worm, it's like... Get out of here! So for my Doctor Who team, I would choose British accents and you would choose American accents for your X-Files team. I think there was a specific uh, voice uh, uh, with uh, maybe like uh, investigating uh, American uh, detectives detectives or something like that. So yeah. I used that one. <laughs> and then we have a situation where your Mulder worm would take shots at my Tom Baker <laughs> worm. So uh, that's... That's kind of fun to make situations like that. And they just look like small cartoony worms, but they have the name over them and like a similar accent. And you can do, you just make uh, the fun up in your head, kind of. Now we're just assuming that people know about X-Files, but can we assume that? It's an American science fiction show. From the 90s. Yeah, it's possible that we're going to cover it more extensively on the podcast later. We should. I love that show. I also really love it. You introduced me to it. But let's cover that at another time. Yeah. Any other PC games you played? I remember I had a really old computer in my room. I think it was discarded by a a school nearby. So I got it for free. 
and I was playing Commander Keen on it. That's that's probably a really old game. You know Commander Keen? No, I think I've heard the name, but I'm not sure what it is. I think it was just uh, like a side-scroller game where I think you were picking up food. Oh, and I also had a game called Ski or Die. Oh. Which I guess was really bad. (laughs) Oh, it was? I think so. How? That wasn't really much fun. Oh, and and the music was like... uh, I think it was like trying to simulate electrical guitars or something, so it was really squeaking, (laughs) screeching in the ears. (laughs) Maybe I had Tetris on that computer as well. Tetris follows me everywhere, so... Anyone over the age of 25 must have played Tetris. If you haven't, go and play Tetris as soon as you can. Don't you think everybody has played Tetris? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. If they haven't, then they are missing like a fundamental gaming experience. (laughs) Even people that are not gamers, most people have played Tetris at some point. I think my mom has played Tetris. Exactly. So if you're listening to this and you have never tried a single game of Tetris, just find it somewhere and just give it a shot. You don't need to play it for long. Just so you can say that you have played Tetris at some point. Because at this point, that's kind of a fundamental human experience that most humans on this earth has experienced. So go and find Tetris and just, just try a few rounds. I think it's more like meditation or mindfulness or something. It's quite addictive, actually. I know a different game you have played because you have a small statue of a character from that game in your office. Yeah, that's uh, Duke Nukem, but uh, now I sound like a hardcore fan, but but it's not like that at all. The reason I have that statue is that I actually won a competition where I I won a limited edition of the... That Duke Nukem game for PlayStation 3. Um, yeah, that one that wasn't that great. Duke Nukem Forever. It was. Yeah, that, that was the title. It was a game that was stuck in development hell for way too long. And I, th- I think it possibly holds a record for the game that was stuck in development hell the longest. And it really shows. It's like when it came out, it was already outdated. And just a mess of different ideas and it it wasn't really good. I played it and uh, I can't say I enjoyed it that much. Just it it was a particularly weird experience. I got something out of playing it, but I wouldn't recommend it in any way. I still think I have to go back and play it some more because I think I gave up too easily. But everyone says it's really bad, so it's not very tempting. (laughs) Yeah, you have a lot of really good games that you should experience at some point, so don't waste your time on that one. Yeah, just for the record, I don't consider myself a gamer and I don't really play that much. Yeah, you're more like a normal person that just happens to play video games. I would call myself a gamer because that's just like... You are a gamer, yeah. definitely. That's one of my main hobbies. Yeah. But yeah, you say that you only have the bust on your desk because you won it in an online competition. But you have won a lot of stuff in online competitions because that's one of your hobbies too. <laughs> it used to be one of my hobbies. I was doing it a lot more when I was single. And now that we have a baby, it's not really that much time for contests online. Yeah, but what I'm saying is you've won a lot of things, but you don't have all of them in the apartment still. No, well, uh, I thought the bust was kind of cool. And uh, my brother used to play a lot of Duke Nukem on his computer back in the 90s, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I was watching, watching him play a lot of times. I think maybe... Maybe not now, but before it was like girls weren't playing that much. They were more like watching other people play. <laughs> Is that yeah accurate? I'm... Well, you would know better than me, but uh, I, I, I think gaming used to be considered a male hobby. And at least for the companies that made the the video games, they were marketed mainly at men. Yeah, because in Duke Nukem, there are a lot of 
like female strippers <laughs> walking around and and you can also offer them money to make them take their top off and dance or something like that yeah. so it was very much um, directed towards boys <laughs> yeah boys or men yeah but a lot of boys of course played it yeah but you know i i played a little bit duke nukem not not a lot but a little bit and we also tried to make our own levels oh that's cool did it have an integrated level designer in it or did you uh, learn how to code or something no it was like a, a generator thing i guess it was a little bit complicated yeah. so it, it was a lot of work making stuff but like it was probably more complicated than mario maker is now yeah yeah there was like something like a blueprint where you had to like draw things and there was some coding i think yeah so it was closer to actual video game development than like i said mario maker because mario maker has really gamified level design yeah everything is so easy today when it comes to making your own levels and in some games there's yeah if if the developers want you to make levels yeah and in duke nukem apparently they did include a generator for people to make levels but they didn't make it as easy as it is today yeah as far as i remember like i said it was my brother who was into it i was just trying out stuff and yeah so did you make some cool levels you remember any i don't think we really got that far because we were i remember i think we were like drawing a toilet that we wanted to jump into and <laughs> and then uh, kind of pop up another place and it was a bit hard with water and diving in different levels. So we were just trying out techniques, I guess, just to learn it. And then I guess we probably lost interest after a while. <laughs> yeah, I can see that stuff like that can be interesting when you're first getting into it. But when you're starting to try to make good levels, then you see how difficult it actually is. And then you lose interest a little bit. Yeah, like I said, it, it took a lot of work and you had to learn stuff and, you know, kids are impatient. <laughs> I think people in general are impatient. There's a lot of people that find new hobbies and then drop them as soon as it gets a little bit difficult. Mm. I've noticed that in myself and stopped myself. It used to be that I got really into something that I wanted to do and then I found out it was really hard and then I stopped trying. But uh, at some point, I just found out that I'm going to really regret it if I don't commit to something that I really want to make. I have a lot of stuff I want to make. I have a blog, this podcast, I have a comic book that I'm making. We're going to talk about that stuff later in a different podcast. Let's not get bogged down in that right now. But yeah, at some point, I just figured that... I'm going to have to start focusing on actually making these things a reality instead of just thinking, oh, I should do that. Because then I'm going to really regret it at some point and think, why did I waste all these years not doing the stuff that I wanted to do? And like, it wouldn't be wasting them that way. I would do other stuff that I wanted and just play more video games, I guess. But... I, I like my making stuff for myself as well. And uh, I really had to stop myself from getting bored when it got hard. That really makes me re regret uh, not committing to learn an instrument. Because that's something I would like to do. So I, <laughs> I regret that. I have a keyboard and a guitar standing around, but I, I couldn't play them to save my life. <laughs> well, it's not too late. Never too late. Do you have any more games you want to talk about? Uh, yeah, I played some Action Quake, I think it was called, with my brother. Uh, we played uh, with uh, LAN. Local area network? Yeah, probably. <laughs> and yeah, we just connected our computers. And Quake, of course, is like a first-person shooter game. Yeah, it's a really well-known 90s game that inspired a lot of later multiplayer games. Yeah, I haven't really played that. <laughs> that much either but uh, yeah, I've never played any quick game I remember we were just sniping each other yeah cool so yeah that was my experience with uh, sniping <laughs> oh yeah so that's uh, where you 
started like uh, liking sniping. Yeah. We played uh, a bunch of Borderlands together. Mm-hmm. Specifically Borderlands 2 and Borderlands the pre-sequel. Yes. A- and you always like to snipe. Yeah, I I like that style. It's uh... Yeah, you're 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 far away from the enemies and you can just pick off the enemies slowly while I run in and just go bananas and you can just uh, shoot them from a distance and help me out. Yeah, I like hiding and picking them off one by one. <laughs> we'll probably also talk a lot about our experience with Borderlands at some later point in a different episode. Yeah, I love Borderlands too. That was so much fun. Yeah, it's a really fun game to play with your partner. Yeah, and like I said, I'm, I don't consider myself a gamer, but I had so much fun with that game. Yeah, it's, it's really built for... Everyone. <laughs> yeah, it's really built as a com- communal experience to experience with other people. It, that is the best way to play Borderlands. I don't think I would enjoy it half as much if I played it alone. I don't think I would have bothered playing it alone. Well, I would definitely not have played it alone. <laughs> So we talked a lot about uh, the games you played when you were growing up. Mm -hmm. And we were supposed to start talking about the games that I grew up playing. But we've been talking so long now that I think it's going to be a way too long episode if we talk about all the games that I played. Because I've played a lot more than you've done. Mm. Uh, So I think we're going to take that in the next episode. Okay. But now we have... uh, because uh, uh, Harrison Ford's character in Apocalypse Now was called Colonel G. Lucas. <laughs> That's cool. It's a fun fact. You've watched this movie one time before, right? Yeah, years ago. Probably way too late in the evening. As I understand it, you were a bit disappointed in how little Harrison Ford was involved <laughs> in the movie. Yeah, at that time, because his name was on the cover and uh, I was watching it with a friend and we were really just crazy about uh, Star Wars. We had Star Wars marathons all the time. So we were kind of like, yay, (laughs) Harrison Ford. And then he was barely in it. Yeah, he's pretty much just in the beginning of the film. And I think he is only on the cover because of how famous he would become later. Yeah, probably. I don't care that much today. There are many good actors in the movie. (laughs) But yeah, the movie was directed by Francis Ford Coppola. And it also included some actors from the Godfather films. Yeah, the main antagonist, of course, was played by Marlon Brando. He doesn't show up until late in the movie. (laughs) Yeah, except in uh, pictures and voice recordings that the main character is listening to. Yeah. And of course, Marlon Brando played the Godfather himself in the first Godfather movie Mm -hmm. and also Robert Duvall Mm -hmm. and Robert Duvall played Tom Hagen I think he was the consigliere or something like that the advisor to the Godfather all right yeah I may be wrong you've seen those movies more than I have so yeah they are wonderful I really like them too I need to watch them more yeah you've only seen them once yeah in their entirety i've only seen them one time i've seen like bits and pieces many times on television yeah and i have the box set so i've been watching them quite a few times (laughs) or else i wouldn't have remembered anything so yeah apocalypse now is a movie about the vietnam war Mm -hmm. which lasted from 1955 to 1975 And the movie came out just four years after the war ended in 1979. We watched a YouTube documentary. Didn't they talk about actually going to Vietnam and film it during the Vietnam War? Yeah, that was the plan. Because during the pre-production and uh, writing the script and everything like that, all of that was going on before the war was actually ended. So they were planning filming a movie in Vietnam like during the war. That sounds like a bad idea. (laughs) Yeah, actually they didn't even film it in Vietnam after the war ended. Where did they film it? Oh, they didn't go to the Philippines, did they? Yeah, they did. Northern Philippines. Uh, Yeah. So the movie starts in Saigon and we see Martin Sheen's character, Captain Benjamin L. Willard. And he gets called in on a mission briefing. And in this mission briefing scene, that is the only scene Harrison Ford is in. And Willard gets a mission to assassinate a rogue colonel named Kurtz, played by Marlon Brando. Did they bring up that he was rumored to be crazy in that scene? 
Yeah, I think so. They were at least saying that he had gained control of a group that was following his orders no matter how crazy the orders were. Yeah, and that's why the US military feels it's important to take Colonel Kurtz out of the picture because he's a rogue element. They don't know what he's going to do and he has control of a large group of dedicated followers. He had killed four double agents. Wasn't that like the charge? Yeah, that's their reason for wanting him executed. But I think it's mostly that I didn't have control of him anymore. Yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, it was a bigger issue that they couldn't tell him what to do anymore. Mm, Yeah. But yeah, Captain Willard agrees to the mission and starts traveling down a river on a small boat with a crew that is going to be along on, on the journey for most of the film. Mm. The crew consists of Chief Phillips, the captain of the boat, a guy they just call Chef, another guy they just call Clean, and another guy they call Lance. And now Clean is played by Lawrence Fishburne. Oh, you know what I read about him on Wikipedia? No, what? I read that he lied about his age to get the role. He was only 14 when he got the role, but... uh, Since the movie took so long to finish, he was actually 17 by the time the filming ended. Oh, cool. Which is also the age that his character is supposed to be. Are any of the scenes filmed when he was 14, do you think? Probably, since they started then. I don't know. (laughs) If if they filmed it in uh, chronological order, then you could probably just watch him age a bit. (laughs) And, it's, and you could think like, oh yeah, yeah, it's the events happening in the movie that is aging him so quickly. <laughs> also, he, of course, he plays Morpheus in The Matrix, if anyone wonders. So that's kind of cool. It took a while. I was just, it was when he started talking, I recognized his teeth. <laughs> and, I, yeah. and I was like, oh, that's Morpheus. <laughs> yeah, it was really cool to watch him that young because... He looked like a cool dude. <laughs> Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> no, but he had that cool 70s uh, vibe. I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting what you're putting down. <laughs> daddy <laughs> <laughs> So Willard heads down the river with the boat. And soon they come across a village in fire where the US is battling the Viet Cong. They get in contact with the American platoon's leader, Lieutenant Colonel Bill Kilgore. Played by Robert Duvall. That's a good name. Yeah, that's uh, pretty on the nose, as names go. Mm. During the battle, we also see Francis Ford Coppola in a cameo as a director of a TV crew during the battle. Mm. You spotted him, right? I didn't notice (laughs) him. Yeah, they were just sweeping the camera across and I was like, was that Francis Ford Coppola? (laughs) Yeah, and that... TV crew is like just filming and taking pictures of the American soldiers during the battle. So after the battle, when the US forces has taken the village, they have a party with a bonfire and they just really try to forget that they're in a battle and just chill and drink beers and have a good time. Was it the voiceover that said that the more they tried to enjoy themselves and forget where they were, the more they remembered where they were? Yeah. And or something like that? Yeah, the more they were missing home and stuff like that. Hmm. We forgot to mention, the whole movie was narrated in voiceover by Martin Sheen. Like he is telling it like this is something that has already happened to him. Hmm. And we don't really know when this film is taking place. It's sometime in the Vietnam War, but as I was saying... That's between 1955 and 1975. I'm sure there's some clues. I'm thinking music. Well, I I bet the movie is supposed (laughs) to be taking place close to the end of the war. But I really don't know. I I don't really know that much about that time period. Uh, No, we weren't born, so we're excused. Yeah, and also if we're saying anything that is historically incorrect about this war... We're from Norway, and our school system really didn't... They didn't cover it. Yeah, they didn't cover it as much as it probably was covered in American schools. Mm. Like, this is a big deal for America, but it's not, like, a really big deal for Norway. This. Well, we have many fugitives from the Vietnam War living here today. Yeah. So, 
it is important in that way but uh, yeah but it's not something that the people in charge of making the school curriculum would think is important enough to like really highlight not when i was in school yeah i don't know how it is today yeah world history is a very big subject so they kind of have to narrow it down and yeah. focus on more local things i guess like we probably learned a lot more about viking culture and stuff like that mm, yeah yeah so back to the bonfire party during that party captain willard approaches kilgore and the two of them get to talking and captain willard convinces kilgore to take a beach from the Viet Cong, and the way he convinces kilgore is because kilgore really want to surf and that beach is apparently very good for surfing yeah that's a good reason i guess <laughs> <laughs> yeah so they roll in on their helicopters the following morning one of the helicopters picks up the boat carries it with them on wires and during the air ride kilgore starts blasting wagner music at high volume to scare the vietnamese <laughs> yeah, it's the ride of the Valkyries. Yeah, very famous piece. Yeah, it's an opera piece, right? Yeah, there was some squealing. <laughs> I have to admit, when I hear that song, I'm just thinking helicopters. I I don't consider it as yeah. a song on its own. It's a bit weird. Well, I think most people at this point think about Apocalypse Now when they hear that music. At least people who are into movies. I think it's so ingrained into pop culture that most people would just think about that without even having seen the movie. That's the case with me. I haven't seen this movie before now. But that music has always made me think of helicopters. Yeah. So I think this scene sort of shows the contrast between high culture uh, with the opera and the violence they are perpetrating on their enemies while this music is blaring out. Mm. And yeah, this attack on this beach and this village by the beach is uh, really a lot of destruction and sort of a fireworks display of explosions and gunfire going on. Yeah, that's where we got the famous quote by Robert Duvall's character. Kilgore. Son. Nothing else in the world smells like that. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. You were a bit surprised it was just said like that. I was expecting like yelling like oh, I love the smell of napalm in the morning. But he's kind of really saying it really calmly. You never know what's going to stick with the audience as a memorable quote. Yeah, I don't think if I was watching this in the cinema in 1979, I don't think that would have been the big thing that I took home with me. What would that be? Probably some of the later scenes and the violence and the explosions and the cinematography. I don't think that specific quote would have been one of the things that I was quoting forever. But it's sort of become that way because I've heard it so many times before I watched the movie. It's a good line, don't get me wrong, but I don't think it's that much better than all the other lines in the movie. It's hard to tell, because like you, I knew the line before I knew the movie, so... Yeah, maybe we would have found it interesting, even if we didn't know that it was one of the most famous movie lines ever. I don't know. But yeah, they pretty much decimate this little town and take over completely. But before the battle is even done, Kilgore wants people out on those waves to test the waters for surfing. Like, there are people out in the water and surfing while there are, are explosions going on around them and everything is really surreal. I wonder if that really happened. Yeah, I don't think exactly that happened, but maybe other stuff that is sort of similar, but the movie isn't really completely based on a true story. There's a lot of small truths that are compiled into a whole. It's not like a docudrama or something. No, it was based on an old book that, did, that didn't actually take place during the Vietnam War. It took place during another war, I think. Yeah, it was... I don't even think it was about another war. The, that book is called Heart of Darkness. And in it, there's a man on a boat who is obsessed with an ivory trader called Kurtz. So the same as this colonel played by Marlon Brando. 
uh, Walter Eckert. So yeah, that's some similarities, but there's all this new stuff about the Vietnam War in the movie as well. Yes, I'm reading now that Heart of Darkness was set in Congo. Yeah. So, yeah. And so pretty soon, Willard and the boat crew leave Kilgore's platoon to head further down the river to find Kurtz. I think it's important to note here that Willard is on a secret mission and the boat crew doesn't really know what he's doing. Yes. So the boat crew takes a little break out in the jungle and Willard and the character nicknamed Chef goes out in the jungle looking for mangoes. That's gotta be nice to pick mangoes right from the tree. Yeah, normally it would probably be nice, but then they get attacked by a tiger. (laughs) Yeah, I wouldn't go into the jungle anyway. It seems like a very scary place. You can get those uh, bugs under the skin. (laughs) Yeah, it's not really the big stuff that I would be really worried about. I would be worried about everything in the jungle. That's why I'm never going to the jungle. Yeah, I agree. (laughs) I'm glad we agree on that. (laughs) But yeah, the only reason I would even consider going to the jungle is because of how beautiful this movie makes it look. Yeah, those gorgeous palm trees. I don't know if they are palm trees. They look like palm trees to me. (laughs) The movie sort of makes me think about the quote about Kubrick. How he wanted for his movies that every frame should be like a painting. Mm. And I sort of think that this film also encapsulates that way of thinking. Because Mm. I think you can pause it at almost any point and it's going to look amazing. Yeah, maybe. But the thing about Kubrick was that he was a photographer, so he was uh, thinking very much uh, composition in every frame. I didn't really think about it now that we were watching this movie. I was more stricken by the use of light. Yeah, there's a lot of really cool use of light in this movie. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting and beautifully done. (laughs) I I can't remember that I've noticed that same kind of lighting before. But maybe since we knew we were going to talk about this, maybe that was why I noticed it. Yeah. Because I don't really normally notice a lot of technical (laughs) things in movies. Yeah, (laughs) since we know that we're going to talk about this for the podcast, we're taking it a lot more serious than normally when watching a movie. Like I have three pages here with notes. I didn't take any notes, just for the record. Yeah, well, (laughs) I took a lot of notes and normally... I wouldn't have been taking notes. Are you sure? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, well. The film is sort of like a road movie too, kind of. I would sort of classify it as a road movie. It's of course a war movie first and foremost, but it's sort of a road movie where this boat crew travels from location to location and experiences like different things that don't really have that much connection to each other. Yeah, Uh, things happen on the way. Yeah, like they met this Kilgore platoon. Mm. And that was a contained little bit of story. And then there was the mango scene and the tiger. And that was its own contained little bit. And uh, I think that's sort of what road movies are. Just a crew of people that needs to travel from one destination to another. And there's an end goal that they need to accomplish at the end of it. But between the start and the finish, there's a lot of different things that don't really have anything to do with the start and the finish. Yeah. Speaking of my notes... I did a little bit of research based on how the American characters refer to Charlie all the time. I'm glad you did that because that's something I would just hear and just not think about. Because when I hear Charlie in a war movie, I'm thinking about the phonetic alphabet. Yeah. So then it's the letter C, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. But that's where my brain stops in a way. It's like, oh, that's the letter C. (laughs) But I'm not thinking what it really means (laughs) yeah well you did understand from context that they were talking about the enemy yeah but before i researched it we were like are they talking about chinese like is it charlie for the chinese it didn't make much sense because (laughs) the vietnam war is a proxy war between the united states and the soviet union you weren't that far off when you were thinking about the phonetic alphabet with charlie Uh, because apparently the Viet Cong comes from the Vietnamese for Vietnamese communist or in Vietnamese Vietnam Cong San and that's where Viet Cong comes from that's a shortening of Vietnam Cong San and then that got shortened to VC for Viet Cong and 
the phonetic alphabet version of VC is Victor Charlie. And that in turn got shortened to Charlie. So it's like a really long way from Vietnam Kong San to Charlie. But uh, yeah. It makes sense when you know it, at it, least. Well, it makes sense when you know it, but that's a crazy long journey for their nickname. Do you think this is common knowledge? I have no idea. I think most people do like us, they just hear Charlie and they think, oh yeah, they're talking about the enemy and that's where they stop thinking about it. But I think that's a pretty cool fact. Mm. So yeah, back to the story. After running away from the tiger and getting back in the boat, the boat crew comes across a village under US control. While trying to get some fuel for the boat, they see a guy selling tickets to a Playboy show being held there that night, where there's going to be women dancing in skimpy outfits in front of a very large crowd of soldiers. Yeah, I can't understand how they would get anything from that. I mean, they could probably barely see them. But, uh, you know, it doesn't end well. They, uh, the soldiers storm the stage. And the playmates have to evacuate in a chopper. Yeah, and there's a few soldiers even holding on to the chopper and getting lifted up in the air. <laughs> and if that chopper hadn't been very convenient right next to the women, who knows what would have happened. I think they should have hired a rock band instead. That would be better for that venue. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. They really put those women in a very dangerous situation. So after that, the boat crew later comes across a Vietnamese shipping boat. And the boat captain decides that they have to search it for contraband. And orders chef to go over in the Vietnamese boat to search it. Yeah, he's looking for his stupid mangoes. <laughs> yeah, he finds some mangoes, but yeah. He... Did he find the mangoes? Yeah, there's some mangoes in a basket. Okay. But yeah, no, what he's actually looking for is weapons and stuff. Because they are worried that this boat is shipping supplies to the Viet Cong. It has a tragic outcome, doesn't it? Yeah, and there's a woman in the boat who freaks out a bit when Chef starts searching a particular basket. And she starts running towards him. And Lawrence Fishburne's character freaks out and starts gunning everyone on the boat down. With a machine gun. But then after the Vietnamese are all killed, Chef checks the basket properly. And it turns out there's just this small white puppy in the basket and that's what the woman was freaking out about she was worried that they would take her puppy Aww. Uh, but uh, the woman is still alive and the crew wants to bring her with them so that she can maybe survive but that would hamper willard's mission so he takes out the gun and, and executes sh- her basically <laughs> yeah so they travel on uh, lance takes the dog and they travel on and comes across the Dolong Bridge, the last US controlled outpost before heading into Kurtz's domain. Is that in Cambodia? That is right before they come to Cambodia. And the Dolong Bridge is in complete chaos. There's like a never ending battle going on there because it's like right on the border of the US controlled territory and they're just losing and gaining ground and losing and gaining ground. Nobody is winning there and there's no chain of command anymore. There's just people fighting. Hmm. Just when they arrive at the Dolong bridge, they meet an army postman that gives them some mail from home. And after leaving Dolan Bridge, they read their letters from their family. And Lawrence Fishburne's character, Clean, gets a tape recording from his mom. And while they're busy with this, and while he is listening to his mother tell him about what they're going to do when he gets home, Clean gets killed by a bunch of enemies that are hiding in the bushes and shoots at them. It was sad when he got killed because he was like... In a way, talking to his mom and she was saying that, you know, she wanted him back and she was making plans for what they were going to do when he got back home. And he was so young and everything. And then he just got gunned down. But at the same time, not long ago, he had uh, wiped out what was maybe a family of uh, Vietnamese civilians aboard the, the shipping boat. So, and, you know, he was a soldier and they weren't soldiers. So... It's a bit, I don't know if they were trying to get across the irony 
that we sort of root for these people that we are following, but they are also committing atrocious crimes. Yeah. But that's war. Yeah, we just saw this character kill a bunch of innocent people and then the movie is trying to make us sad when he dies himself. And It is sad. Yeah, yeah, of course. But, but uh, yeah, there, there is some irony there. Yeah, because I don't think he gunned them down because he was evil. It was more that he panicked Yeah, because he was very young and probably inexperienced and he was just sent there to fight in this war. Yeah, and then when the woman is running towards Chef... He's he, trying to protect him. Yeah, he thinks that the woman is going to like stab him or something when she she's actually just worried about her puppy. Mm-hmm. It makes you think... Well, so they get out of that hairy situation, but not long after this, they are suddenly attacked by a group of Cambodian natives firing arrows at them. But they are also throwing spears, and then the boat captain is killed by a spear. Mm. And he starts kind of freaking out, and I think maybe he tries to pull Willard down on the spear he's impaled with. It's sort it of... It looked like it. Yeah, I don't totally get why he would do that i think maybe he's just freaking out so yeah as a result of the leader of this boat crew getting killed willard finally reveals to the remaining two crew members of the boat chef and lance what his mission is actually about taking down colonel kurtz and they're not too happy about it well not at first willard starts leaving the boat and it's going to go on foot. But Jeff tells him, just get back in the boat, we'll go together. The crew finally arrives in Kurtz's kingdom. They are greeted by a large native tribe, a few Viet Cong soldiers, and an American photojournalist, played by Dennis Hopper. And uh, yeah, he's pretty crazy, this photojournalist. Yeah, I say. He's become a Kurtz fanboy. Yeah, he's like raving about... Oh, uh, yeah, he's a warrior poet and uh, all, all this stuff. And it's pretty obvious that he has lost most of his marbles. <laughs> Willard then meets with Kurtz, but is imprisoned. But Lance actually joins Kurtz. Yeah, he's also lost his marbles. Yeah, Lance, during the course of this film, gets more and more childish. You know, at the point where they kill the, the people in, in the shipping boat. Like, he, he takes the puppy and yeah, he's acting more and more childish. I think it was mentioned that he was doing LSD as well. That could have had something to do with it, maybe? Yeah, it could be. Chef doesn't really like the situation and he tries to contact the US Army on the radio on the boat. And he's trying to organize an air raid on Kurtz's compound. But before he can do this, Kurtz sneaks into the boat and cuts Chef's head off. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> and Willard gets uh, Chef's head served in his lap. Yeah, and he freaks out because he has gotten to know this guy so, so Naturally, well. Naturally, he freaks out. After this, Kurtz meets with Willard again. And he wants Willard to go and visit Kurtz's son to tell him the truth about everything that has been going on in Cambodia with, uh, with Kurtz. Maybe I was very tired at this point, but I didn't really get what the truth was or see why so many people were following. I didn't really get it either actually. It felt like he was sort of crazy and hiding in the shadows, mumbling away. I don't know. Yeah, he did talk a lot about the importance in war of putting aside your morality and being able to act without shame. And I think that could maybe have something to do with it. I think he could be a very violent man while still being a very calculated and intelligent man at the same time. And I think that could have something to do with it. But it seemed like all his followers seemed like worshippers. And in the case of the photojournalist, like fanboys, sort of. (laughs) They didn't seem like soldiers under a leader or citizens in a nation. They seemed like worshippers of a god. And I think there was something about his magnetism that drove people to him. Uh, But that still doesn't really explain what he wanted his son to know. 
like what he was afraid that the son wouldn't get to know. Maybe that he was crazy. Maybe he just wanted his son to know that he wasn't crazy. But I don't know what was he crazy. <laughs> I think it was crazy. He seemed pretty crazy. But yeah, again, we're not sure about this. If someone could explain it to us, that would be great. Yeah, please do. But yeah, he doesn't only want Willard to visit his son and tell him the truth. He also wants Willard to kill him. At least this is what Willard thinks. That Kurtz is slowly dying and he wants to get taken out in combat. Yeah, like a soldier. Yeah, I think this could be the truth, because this mission is secret, so Mm. the US is probably not going to take responsibility for killing him. Right. And he wants to be sure that his son knows that he was taken down in battle, and not that he was... He died from a fever or something. Yeah, or maybe the government would claim that he had killed himself or something. Maybe. So that's why he tells the guy he knows is going to kill him to tell his son the truth about what happened to him. I think that is what's going on here. Yeah. Yeah. So later, Willard sneaks through a sacrificial party where Kurtz's followers are slaughtering a water buffalo. And then Willard kills Kurtz with a machete. Yeah, and it's intercut with them killing the water buffalo. Also with machetes. Yeah, and I I think that was real. I didn't like watching that. Yeah, it looked like they were actually killing that cow. Yeah, on screen. Yeah, it was a bit uh, tasteless. It was a good scene, but I don't know if that was worth it. I think they could have done the same thing without actually killing it. I was just thinking about that uh, thing we saw on YouTube earlier today where they talked about those uh, exploitation movies from the 70s where they showed uh, grotesque like animals killing other animals or people killing animals just for the shock value. Yeah, specifically Cannibal Holocaust Mm. where they filmed some real killings of animals. And uh, like, we're we're not vegetarian or anything, but... We know where we get the meat from. Yeah, but you don't need to be inhumane when killing animals. You don't need to prolong suffering and stuff. It's one thing to kill to feed people. It's another thing to do it for entertainment value. Mm. But yeah, soon Kurtz's people realize that Kurtz has been killed. But they let Willard pass anyway when he tries to leave the temple. But they kind of look at him as if he is the new god. I got that impression. Yeah, me too. I was almost expecting him to stay at the temple and just take over from Kurtz. Mm. But that didn't happen. But I was almost expecting him to stay there. Yeah. But he doesn't. He takes Lance by the hand and guides him to the boat. And the two of them head back towards Saigon. And... The movie ends there, just as they are leaving Kurtz's compound. Yeah, I think they were lucky who got away with their lives after that. Yeah, just as easily all those worshippers could have really freaked out and just killed them. Mm. But yeah, I really, really love this movie. It was amazing. How do you think it ranks with um, Coppola's other two masterworks? The Godfather 1 and 2. Think it's better or just as good or not as good? It's very hard to compare them. (laughs) I think I prefer the Godfather movies. I'm not a huge fan of war movies, but I really liked it. For me, I think the Godfather has a better story. But I think Apocalypse Now has better cinematography. I think it looks beautiful. I think you should watch the Godfather for the story and the acting. And I think the main reason you watch Apocalypse Now is just for the imagery. It looks amazing all the way through. Yeah, like we said, they are totally different kind of movies. Yeah, yeah, so there's really no reason not to watch all three movies. And comparing them is like comparing apples and oranges. (laughs) Yeah, true. So it's your turn to choose a movie that I haven't seen out of your movies. Yeah, this time I've gone with an old German silent movie. Oh, what's that one? I think you know me (laughs) that well. Yeah, it's Metropolis. Yes, by Fritz Lang. It's from the 20s? Yeah, I think it's from 1927. It's a good old movie. (laughs) It's a sci-fi... What genre would you say it is? Dystopian future. So a sci-fi dystopic future movie. Yeah, something like that. 
Well, I'm looking forward to seeing it and talking about it on the next episode. Yeah, me too. I haven't seen it in a few years. No. So I hope you want to watch Metropolis and tune in for the next episode to hear what we have to say about it. Thanks for listening. Bye.